Well, hello everyone. Thank you for joining us in this session of our webinar series. My name is John, and today we are joined by Tally's Director of 5G Applications, Reese Fernandez, and FreeWave's Director of Customer and Technical Support, Greg Corey. Today we will be talking about IIoT connectivity with Intelligent Edge and discuss how these solutions can support your remote operations. First, I'd like to present Reese Fernandez. Reese, can you please introduce yourself? Yeah, perfect. Thank you very much, Jonathan. Um, as Jonathan indicated, my name is Reese Fernandez. I am the 5G Applications Director for Tally. I've been with the company for going on about 17 years this year and have held various roles throughout the, that time frame. So started off in sales, lived on the West Coast, uh, went through some uh, changes in reference to sales management, product management. I am technical by experience. And so it lines up well with helping to support FreeWave and their technical capabilities and in that application that we support from Tally. Um, I've since moved over to uh, Texas and uh, am supporting the country uh, for Tally in the 5G world. So that being said, we definitely appreciate FreeWave for coming uh, to do this webinar with us and to hopefully have some robust conversation in how their application serves the needs of those out there in the SCADA world. Um, so without further ado, I want to go ahead and turn it over to Greg Corey from FreeWave. Great. Thanks, guys. My name is Greg Corey, and I'm the Director of Customer and Technical Support for FreeWave. I've been at FreeWave for about 10 years now. I started as a customer support technician and uh, have moved up through the ranks since then, always keeping a focus on helping customers and learning about customer applications and what scenarios FreeWave products fit best in. Today, we're gonna to be talking about FreeWave as a company. We're gonna give an overview of our product portfolio, and we'll even touch on some applications where FreeWave can make a difference in everyday operations. To start that conversation, who is FreeWave? So we've been in business now for over 27 years. We have customers all across the globe, and FreeWave was made famous by specializing in long-range wireless connectivity. So FreeWave networks serve those undeserved, uh, underserved, we'll say, devices that are not reachable by traditional means. So that includes challenging RF environments that may be obstructed. Um, it could be a number of assets that are scattered across a geographic area. Or it could be also condition-based where you just have a really difficult environment for electronics to operate in. I personally, I've worked in Saudi Arabia where it's 115 degrees. I've worked in Wyoming where it's negative 20. And FreeWave has hardware that covers both ends of the spectrum here. We're proud to be a made in the USA company. So everything we design and manufacture is at our office in Boulder, Colorado. So in this slide here, we're taking a look at some of the companies that FreeWave works with. So some of these logos here, you'll definitely see some thought leaders within their industries. And what all these companies have in common are that they have a need for long range wireless connectivity. They have a need for wireless connectivity because maybe they're flying a drone that, that's five miles away and they need data from it. Maybe they have a large number of field assets and they're trying to optimize processes. Or maybe they're in a manufacturing environment where they have lots of moving devices and carts where traditional cabling isn't a good solution. So FreeWave offers reliable wireless communication in any environment, in any industry where there's a need for that type of connectivity. To kick off our discussion about the products, so FreeWave primarily focuses on the 900 megahertz unlicensed spectrum. And we focus there because we feel that gives the best throughput and range for a lot of our customer applications. So the general trade-off with wireless technology is you can go fast or you can go far. It's very difficult to do both. So for the industrial world, 900 is kind of that sweet spot where it's the best of both worlds 
fields and it fits well in a lot of applications. The high speed data rates here we're looking at, so our serial radios going back to 115.2 kilobits all the way up to four meg for current generation ethernet radios. The security aspect of our wireless devices there, that's become a hot topic and rightfully so in the past couple of years. So we do have 128 and 256 bit encryption available on our wireless devices. Long range, low power. Uh, low power is a key requirement for a lot of customer applications. Um, a lot of times you'll see radios that are operating out in the middle of nowhere, powered by a small battery and a solar panel. For those applications, it's really important that you have a wireless device that does not consume a lot of power. Um, and that is because obviously it's powered by solar, but also the size of the batteries. So some of these enclosures that are field mounted are quite small and there's not a lot of real estate for a battery size there. So FreeWave has kept this in mind when designing our hardware. The industrial grade, so we do have class one div two for folks that are familiar with the oil and gas industry out there. We also have class one div one devices. So that's a classification for an area where are there are gases that could likely ignite and explode. Um, so FreeWave has whoops, that angle covered on in terms of what environments we operate in. And the last point on this slide here, the industrial data retrieval. So we have serial, we have ethernet interfaces, and then we also have IO interfaces. So for those devices that are uh, pressure sensors, flow sensors, switches, turning things on and off, we do have IO capability alongside our serial and ethernet interfaces. Hey, Greg, can I, before you go on, can I ask you a question too, just for the audience in case they don't know? Sure. Yeah, so um, talk a little bit more about the differences between like a class one div two and a class one div one, if you can, because, you know, in these oil and gas industries, I understand that, um, you know, they have to have certain requirements for protection against flammability or things like that. But is it more than that? Or can you can you expand on that thought? Sure, sure. So the class one div one, that's for the most hazardous environments where there are explosive gases present at a certain concentration for a certain number of hours per year. So class one div one is at a high risk for fumes being ignited there. That's the strongest classification. And class one div one devices are really special in that when you're actually designing the hardware, um, you have to ensure that it's not capable of producing a spark that could ignite something. Um, when we move to class one div two, there are still uh, hazardous gases present that could be ignited, but the time that they're present and the concentrations are less, so the hardware is slightly different there. So there's, a, I will say, a sliding scale system based on the time of exposure for these explosive gases and the concentrations that they're at. Okay, I got you. So so class one div one would obviously be a more expensive solution than a class one div two just because of more stringency. Yep, and there, there's two ways you can do class one div one. So you can have something that's intrinsically safe. And what that means is you just design the hardware so mm -hmm. it's not capable of producing a spark. You can also take something that's not intrinsically safe and put it inside an explosion proof container that if it does ignite something, it'll contain the explosion. So there, there are two different ways to uh, approach class one div one. Okay. And right. our current IO line is actually intrinsically safe. Um, the hardware was designed with that requirement in mind. Very good. Thank you for expanding on that. Great, thanks for stopping me there. Okay, moving on to a picture here of an application for water management. So FreeWave has a number of large customers in the water wastewater space. And when we talk about water wastewater, we have a large number of assets over a geographic area. Uh, 
we have you know storage tanks, we have lift stations, we have pump stations, and all of these systems need to interoperate and share data in order to get you know the most out of process optimization there. So FreeWave has many devices uh, in our portfolio that are suited for water management. We have uh, sensors for pressure. Um, we have I/O for looking at tank levels. We have serial and Ethernet connectivity, and these are all rugged industrialized hardware devices that will fit um, pretty much in any of these applications we're talking about here. And the problem that this solves is being able to remotely monitor those data points and also do control. So not only are we monitoring processes, but we're able to actively control based on that data that we're retrieving there. Moving on to a agriculture application here. So FreeWave also has a number of customers in the ag space. And in the ag space, we work with uh, dairies to optimize feed management. Uh, we have GPS applications for auto steer tractors. And then we have other general wireless solutions for automation. And all of those solutions, again, are about moving data to and from the field, making decisions based upon that data, and optimizing those processes. Another application I want to mention is center pivot irrigation. So as we've all you know flown across the West and you look out the window of the plane, you see the large circles, those are center pivot irrigators. So you have a central tower and then an arm that moves around that to water plants and distribute fertilizer and things like that. So FreeWave has a large footprint in monitoring center pivot irrigation. We can tell the location of the arm, how much water it's putting out, and other similar data points. So in both of these scenarios we just discussed, why would you use a wireless solution? The first point is the cost of installing physical cabling. So when we talk about shorter distances, and by shorter distance, I, we could be 500 feet, you know, maybe a quarter mile, something of that nature. Freeway considers those to be short distances. Sometimes you have the option of running physical cable, but what is the cost of running that cabling? Does it need to be trenched? Is there an existing workplace that's going to be disturbed and result in downtime? Um, with wireless, obviously we don't have to disturb the physical environment there for those uh, short distance applications. So wireless has a benefit there. Next is when we talk about troubleshooting wired systems. So I have a number of friends that work in large scale breweries and when they're dealing with instrumentation, they, they have stories about you know pulling cable that had been in there for 20 to 25 years. None of it is marked. Uh, it makes troubleshooting really difficult. Um, you can disturb those physical wires. So a lot of the times those older manufacturing environments may not be documented well in terms of their wiring. So we can completely eliminate that dimension when we're using wireless. Thirdly here is the reliability, and that was a point I just touched on there. Anytime we have a physical medium, whether it be installed out somewhere in a field or in a manufacturing facility, um, there is a chance that that cabling could be disturbed if it is you know, accidentally sliced uh, during an upgrade or something like that. That can result in downtime for the system. When we deal with wireless, we don't have to worry about damaging those physical installations. Next is the distances that you can cover. So I mentioned we consider short range to be, you know, 500 feet, quarter mile, you know, along those lines. Uh, freeway radios can also accommodate many miles. So I've dealt with customer applications where it could be 10, 20 miles, the wireless link they're communicating over. And those distances, you just simply can't run cable that long unless you wanna spend a lot of money investing in that infrastructure. So wireless, these key points here are why FreeWave offers a solution that has a return on investment. 
So it's not just the ease of working with applications and uh, having maybe some greater data speeds. It's about the return on investment. And with wireless, you can see that it will save money in terms of physical installation, troubleshooting, and some of the distances that you just can't cover um, cost-wise from that perspective. Last point here on the Y wireless slide is we can do more than cabling. So this is a final point here. Traditionally, industrial radios, like the ones Freeway manufactures, have simply been a conduit for data. We're just moving data in and out. But now with radios, we can actually do data processing at the edge of a network. And that's important to make those immediate decisions. Traditionally in SCADA, we have relied on something called pull response, where we send a question and we get a response to that question. So that's pull response. And the message has to traverse the entire network in order to make that decision. If you can make that decision at the edge of the network, we've reduced our latency and we've also eliminated the possibility of that link failing and not being able to make that decision. And we'll talk about that more in another slide here. Moving on to our IO solutions portfolio here and also Ethernet. So the industrial radio on the left here, that is our ZoomLink radio. That's the Z9PE. Uh, the unlicensed band specifically is 902 to 928. The range on this, we say up to 60 miles. That's definitely on the longer side of things. You would need a really specific environment with a ultra clear line of sight and high gain antennas, but it certainly is possible to go that distance but more commonly, probably between five and 15 miles, I see with this type of radio, um, up to four meg uh, over the air RF data rate, and also the built-in security we discussed earlier. Now, ZoomLink does have the option of running software at the edge, and we also have a hardware version that is not a radio, right? It's just an edge computer, so that's called Zoom IQ. So, so that is essentially a ZoomLink radio with the radio removed. If you just want to run applications, um, think of it as an industrial Raspberry Pi per se. Moving along here, the Zoom Edge unit. So Zoom Link is for serial and Ethernet connectivity. We then took that platform and we added I/O to it, and that is what Zoom Edge is. And Zoom Edge is expandable, so you can see the modules on the top there. The radio base, that is Zoom Link on the bottom, and then you simply snap on I.O., um, depending on what your I.O. needs are there. Last product in this slide is the Wave Contact System. So this point we touched on earlier when we were talking about different classifications for hazardous environments, most commonly oil and gas. Wave contact is a C1, D1 device. So you can place this wireless device in those environments and uh, not have to worry about any safety hazards that may arise from its use. All right, next we're gonna look at some serial solutions here. So this is what made Freeway famous as a company, our, our serial solutions here. So the FGR3 serial radio, that is built upon over 20 years of experience in building serial radios. So the original serial radio from Freewave was the DGR, then we went to FGR, FGR2, FGR3. So there's a lot of longevity in that product portfolio. And if you happen to have a DGR that's 20 years old, if you bought an FGR3 today, this radio would talk to that older radio from 20 years ago. So we had backwards compatibility within the serial product family. Backwards compatibility is really important for large scale installations. Um, nobody enjoys hearing that the hardware they have is now obsolete and they're gonna have to change you know, the entire system in order to move to the next platform there. With our serial product line, we've ensured that we have backwards compatibility all the way to 20 years ago. 
The middle category here is the LRS 455, and that stands for Licensed Radio System. So this operates in the 450 band. Um, unlike the FGR3, this is actually a licensed product. So you have to contact the FCC to get a license to operate it. The advantages of that are greater output power. So as I mentioned earlier, the general trade-off with wireless is you can go fast or you can go far. And the 455 is a product that was designed to go very far, but it's not as fast as the FGR3 or the ZoomLink platform over the air. Lastly here is our GX radio. So this is 2.4 gigahertz. So the G there stands for global. Not every country in the world can use unlicensed 902 to 928. For those environments, we have the GX, which is a 2.4 gig radio. The output power is half of what you're gonna see with the unlicensed 900, but it does allow you to operate in countries that don't allow 900 megahertz. Next, we're going to talk about ethernet communications. So as I mentioned earlier, the ZoomLink radio is more than an industrial radio. It's an industrial computing platform. And whenever I'm doing the, these webinars, the way I describe that is ZoomLink is the smart radio of the industrial data world. Um, back when cell phones first became prevalent, we only used cell phones for sending and receiving calls. And that is very much like what we did with industrial radios. They were just for sending and receiving data. Now in the consumer space, as time has gone on, um, we spend more time uh, on apps in our phones or text messaging. Um, we actually don't use them as much for calls as we did in the past. So we're taking that approach to the industrial data world where yes, it can still make calls, send and receive, but it's really about the software that you're running at the edge there. So it's a smart radio, it can host applications. We have a number of software partners that have packages you can load onto the radio, you can do custom development. Um, in today's world, and this also accounts for the consumer space, it's becoming not about what hardware you're using, but what software you're running on top of that. And FreeWave believes that's really the future of the industry when it comes to this type of wireless technology. Here are some of the specs for the ZoomLink radio in depth here. So as we mentioned, it's a four meg radio. The standard features, as I just mentioned there, it can host applications. So uh, AutoSol, uh, Node-RED, OpenPLC, those are some of the applications you'll commonly seen run on this radio there. We have two ethernet ports. We also have a version that has a single serial port, depending upon your need there. It can function in a point-to-point -point or point-to-multipoint network. The topology is pretty flexible. We have repeater functionality. I've seen networks that operate, you know, just one radio talking to another. I've seen networks that have 30 radios in them. I've seen networks that have, you know, three central repeaters. It really just depends on the uh, geographic layout of the area that you're operating. The power consumption is something we mentioned earlier. So at 12 volts in transmit, 270 milliamps there on um, the 12 volt mode. So that's ideal for those solar applications. Moving to the right hand side here, um, these are some software technologies that are proprietary to FreeWave. So the adaptive Spectrum learning, ASL, that's when we learn where noise is in the 902 to 928 range, and the radio will attempt to hop around that specific noise in the band. We also have forward error correction, packet compression, and packet aggregation. Now, these are all fancy titles. Um, a lot of this stuff happens underneath the hood of the radio. It'll increase reliability, distance, and speed in all of the applications we've previously mentioned here. All right, moving on to Zoom Edge. So this is the newest member 
of the ZoomLink radio platform. And ZoomEdge adds I.O. capability to ZoomLink networks. The nice thing about this is if you had previously deployed a ZoomLink network and you wanted to add I.O., you can drop in a Zoom Edge and it's compatible over the air with that existing system there. We support up to 15 expansion modules on the Zoom Edge base radio there. Uh, I personally have never seen more than three expansion modules there. So essentially we have unlimited IO. Um, I actually would challenge anybody on the call here if you can think of an application uh, that could use 15 expansion modules there. I would love to hear about it. And for those of you that may not be familiar with IO, um, we've talked about serial, which is RS-232 or RS-485. We've talked about ethernet communications, but there are also devices out in the field that are not serial or ethernet based. So an example of an analog input is if you have a pressure sensor and depending on how much pressure is placed on that sensor, it outputs current or voltage. You can take that into an analog input and we call it an analog input because it's a range of numbers. So if you have like a zero to 500 pound transmitter, that's an example of an analog input for a zoom edge unit. The opposite of that, if you have an analog output, is you wanna send a specific voltage level or a specific current to control a, a process or you know, open a valve just to a certain amount there, that's an analog output. Digital input is really simple. That's an on or off state for something. Most common example for a digital input you'll see in process control um, is tank level. So if there's a float switch for a high level alarm, um, that's an example of a digital input. We're just simply closing a contact there. Digital output is the opposite, where instead of seeing if something is on or off, we're telling something if it's going to be on or off. So digital outputs are used to control uh, pumps, uh, lights, and, and other types of devices in the field. We can also supply a power source to those sensors. So the sensor is actually getting its power from the zoom edge unit there. Taking a look at this in the bigger picture, so you'll see a number of I.O. devices on the left-hand side, analog outputs, analog inputs, digital ins and digital outs, and some of those devices that I just mentioned there. On zoom edge, you could also be running software. So if you wanted to have a dash board that you can log into remotely and see the current values for those devices that's possible you could run ignition edge uh, you could run node red open plc some of those applications that i mentioned before um, i have personally used node red to prototype applications so if you haven't seen node red definitely check it out it's a graphical front end uh, for javascript so I am not a software developer, but I was able to piece together a couple of really cool applications that did logic, you know, based upon this input, you know, take this action on the output. You can see the process in a web browser and things like that. Um, really cool stuff there and actually fairly easy to use if you're not a software developer. Hey, Greg, I think that you guys actually have, or you used to have a website where you could have customers log in and take a look at a live system. Is that still available or no? It's something, yeah, we did have that available uh, for a while, and we're going to be looking at launching the next version of that within probably a month or so. So okay. not currently, um, but yes, we will have that demo up again. Right, and I, I've uh, personally seen that node read before in the past, and it is pretty simple logic. I'm no programmer myself either, but and I think you're going to talk about buses in a little bit here too, and I, I, I do have a question about that myself and hopefully for the audience intended as well. Okay, great. Um, so the next spot here when we talk about software at the edge is MQTT. So that stands for Message Query Telemetry Transport, which is a mouthful, um, but MQTT is 
a newer protocol uh, for moving data. And MQTT is really gaining traction in the industrial market as an open protocol that is not proprietary. So we spoke about pull response, which is how we've done SCADA for 30 years. Ask a question, you get a response. Um, some of the downsides of using a pull re response protocol is that the protocol will ask the same message even if the data hasn't changed. So like, let's say you have a tank level and that tank level doesn't really change throughout the day, but you continually ask that tank what the level is every five minutes. Even though you're getting the same answer every time, you're using time and space on the wireless network to do that. And by switching to something like MQTT, that is not pull response. It's what we call a publish protocol in which we can monitor that tank level at the edge of the network. And if it falls within an outside range of numbers, we can then just publish that message directly from the edge of the network. So it's the opposite of pull response. It's not proprietary um, and it saves time and space on the network. When you're dealing with narrow band networks that may not have a lot of throughput available, um, little things like that can add up to make a big difference in network performance. So MQTT is a way to use an open protocol and also lighten the load on your current network there. On the right-hand side of the screen here, we have the cloud icon. So a lot of these solutions can be integrated to work with cloud platforms. MQTT works really well uh, with cloud platforms. It's easy to program. In addition to MQTT, there's also an API for Zoom Edge. So that's application programming interface. So if you want to write some custom code, you know, that looks at an analog output and then publishes it, you can do that without having to use a specific industrial protocol. Moving on to the next slide here. So this is the REST API. And for those of you that are unfamiliar with REST API, it's a really easy way for a software developer to extract a piece of data um, from a service there. So we do have an integrated REST API and natively the platform is based upon Modbus. So if you're familiar with Modbus TCP, you can still use that. You can also convert Modbus to the newer uh, protocol MQTT that we spoke about. There are a number of software solutions out there today that you can load onto a Zoomlink radio, or you could also leverage the tools that we have available on there. This is a screenshot from the Zoom Edge web interface here. So you'll see a number of addresses and functions. Uh, each channel is laid out in a hierarchy here. So if you look at the left-hand side there under modules, we have it logically stacked and you can see the current value for those IO channels. This is a significant improvement over the, we'll say legacy FreeWave IO devices. You had to pull those devices externally to see their current values. But now with Zoom Edge, you can simply log into that unit remotely, see what the value for the sensor is and troubleshoot it if need be. That actually makes troubleshooting a lot easier in that you know that value in the unit is good before you send it to SCADA or a cloud application. Now looking at the big picture here. So this is a ZoomLink network in which we have some standard ZoomLink endpoints. So those could be connected to these devices via serial or ethernet. Um, you can do 232 or 485. On the bottom here, we have a Zoom Edge unit and that's connected to some IO devices. So we have a level sensor, temperature sensor, a flow controller, and that all goes into the expansion module on top of the Zoom Edge radio. So over the air, we're talking 900 megahertz unlicensed, so 902 to 928. As I mentioned earlier, it could be 500 feet, um, it could be up to 10, 15 miles sometimes in an open air environment. The types of obstacles that 900 meg can penetrate really depend upon what the material is. 
So sometimes gentle rolling hills will work okay. Um, we have some links that are through buildings and manufacturing facilities. Um, it just really depends on what the material is. Probably the worst thing you can put is a uh, filled concrete block. So those older buildings that are poured concrete, sometimes those can be difficult. But uh, I'll say I'm usually surprised with 900 megahertz. Um, there's often times where it seems to defy the laws of physics and that I look at a signal path and I say, hey, I don't, I don't think that's going to work. And we set it up and more often than not, the link will actually work there. With that being said, we're still bound by the laws of physics. And uh, if you have any concerns about a signal path, contact us and we'll help you evaluate it. Moving to the right-hand side of the screen here, we have our ZoomLang gateway. And the gateway hardware is the same as the endpoint hardware. If we had a repeater in here, it would be the same hardware. We have a three port model, we have a four port model, we have a board level. Um, so there's lots of variations depending upon your application needs. That gateway is often connected to a switch or a router that's connected to fiber. Um, you also commonly see gateways connected to cellular modems. And with cellular modems, it's there are some situations where you'll see a mixed topology. So maybe you want to drop in a single cell modem and then jump into a Zoom link network from there. The advantages of doing a setup like that are you only have to pay, you know, the cellular carrier fee for one modem, and then the Zoom link network handles the uh, actual endpoints there. So we see cellular. Uh, as a competitive technology, but it's also um, complementary to us in that you do see mixed topologies there. It really depends on do you have cellular signal, you know, in that region that you're looking to operate? Uh, do you prefer investing in hardware and not having a reoccurring fee? Um, these are just kind of some of the number of factors that you look at for return on investment when we talk about ground-based networks, privately owned like ZoomLink versus cellular there. And on the right-hand side here, continuing our discussion about the topology, um, ZoomLink can publish directly to the cloud. It could be connected to network infrastructure, corporate infrastructure. It can publish to the cloud. Um, it's really flexible in those types of topologies. As long as there's ethernet or serial, we can make a connection with the ZoomLink network. All right, so another bubble that I wanted to highlight here uh, is the remote management aspect. So with remote management, if you have a number of ZoomLink radios out in the field, we do have a cloud-based system for monitoring those devices, upgrading firmware, looking at performance statistics, so that's free wave remote management. So the remote management, that's available per license per Zoom link radio. That allows visibility from the cloud to the edge of the network. Lastly, the last bubble here, and I don't know if you guys can see that, and uh, I apologize for that technical difficulty, is the edge data platform. So the, the edge data platform from free wave for the Zoom link radios, that allows you to take standard industrial protocols like Modbus, um, like DNP3, uh, Total Flow Protocol, and convert that to MQTT. What that does is you can modernize a network without having to change the actual field devices. So if you are locked into a specific field device because you have you know, 20 or 30 of them, but you want to use MQTT, um, and then publish to a cloud solution. You can drop in a Zoom link radio, it'll do the protocol conversion, and you have a next generation system that's still using that older hardware out there in the field. All right, did my slide change now? Yes, sir. Okay, great. So this slide is well in pipeline gas measurement. And this is something that FreeWave has been involved with uh, since the beginning of the company. Gas measurement is something we do really well. For those of you out there uh, in the oil and gas industry, you're quite familiar with gas measurements. 
Um, when we talk about the distribution of natural gas, there are a number of points in the system where the actual gas will exchange hands. That's called a custody transfer point. So anytime you're uh, selling gas into a pipeline or from a well, um, there needs to be a meter there so you can measure how much gas has been exchanged and then you bill based upon that meter data. This is a great application for free wave radios. So you can connect ZoomLink radios to these devices in the field and you can actively pull or you can publish if you're using a newer protocol, that meter data there. It essentially allows you immediate online access to these virtual cash registers per se that you have out in the field there. Most commonly, you'll see gas measurement done with solar. Um, most of them are solar out there in the field. Uh, if you've ever about been driving around in a rural area and you see these uh, wells sticking out of the ground or controls or things like that, obviously we don't have power to them, so they will have a solar system that is sized specifically for that application. The value that this offers um, it's almost an impossible task with the number of meters in an average field to drive around and have that data. Um, that would require a lot of man effort to do that, a lot of manpower hours. So freeway radios optimize those types of scenarios by having that data available instantaneously instead of having to drive around and manually collect things. Alrighty, so moving to remote management, and I touched on this a little bit here. So our remote management is about having that visibility to the edge of the network. Um, one thing I covered earlier was it's not just about the hardware anymore. I mean, we all like looking at hardware specs, or, or maybe some of us do, um, but it's more about the software, how we interact with that software, and what visibility it gives us. So free wave remote management, it is cloud-based, so you can log in anywhere you have internet access. You can see the health of your Zoom link network. Um, you can make universal changes, whether it be configuration, firmware, um, it's all available from that central location there. For those of you that have used free wave tool suite in the past, this is, we'll say, the next generation of free wave tool suite in that it is entirely web-based um, and it's auto updating we constantly make updates to it so you don't need to worry about managing software on individual laptops or you know ensuring that those are up to date and the pricing for that is available here and that's available now for all zoom link devices here's another screenshot um, that actually shows you some of the details that you'll see in the remote management system. So the name of the radio, it's uptime, it's current ping time. Uh, it'll give you different statistics on uh, those metrics we covered. Um, it's just really well featured. It's easy to use, well laid out. And those of you that have used Tool Suite in the past 10 years will feel instantly at home in the new remote management solution we have. All right, so moving on, we've uh, covered a lot of technical topics here. We've crammed a lot of information into this single webinar. I do wanna note we have online training available for a number of the topics we covered today. So earlier this year, FreeWave launched an online training platform we currently have certifications for serial radios. That's the SNT, Serial Network Technician. We also have a certification for ZoomLink. That's ZNT, ZoomLink Network Technician. Um, these classes are great. You get to learn at your own pace. Depending on the certification, it can take five to eight hours of coursework to get that certification. There's interactive quizzes, there's videos, and this is actually what we use to train our new technicians. So definitely, if you have a need for training, check that out here um, at our website. You can go to freewave.com, resource center, go to training, 
get sign up and we'll send you a login there. Um, it currently is free. So there's no better reason to get involved and uh, get started learning on Freeway products there. I actually recorded the training sessions there. So if you enjoyed listening to me today, um, there's hours and hours of me talking about in-depth customer applications there. Um, even those FreeWave users that are pretty seasoned that have been using our platform for 10 years have said that the training was helpful and they learned something that they didn't know. So even if you're experienced, there's definitely something you can pick up through these online training classes. All right, and in closing our webinar today, I wanna to mention the 2021 promotion. So this is through our partner Tally there, and we're offering a special discount on a pair of ZoomLink radios that are enabled with the Edge Compute platform. So if you have an interest in anything that we spoke about today, definitely get a hold of Tally and uh, we'll get you set up with a pair of ZoomLink radios. Just to highlight everything that uh, Greg covered today, thank you very much, Greg, Corey, and Freeway for putting this uh, webinar together. Um, we talked th about things anywhere from water and wastewater to agriculture to irrigation, and it all revolves around IoT, machine-to-machine -machine communications, and possibly even displacing some programmable logic controllers in the manufacturing environment. Um, I do want to encourage questions. As Jonathan said before uh, we started and introduced us, uh, if you do have any questions or you want to see the webinar, please come to tallycom.com. That's T-A-L-L-E-Y-C-O-M.com. And uh, please uh, reach out to us. If you already know that you have an application for this as well, I would encourage you to reach out to your Tally sales professional or sales at tallycom.com. We appreciate it. Thank you again for your time. And thank you, Greg, Corey, and the team. And uh, thank you, Jonathan, for putting this together. You guys have a great day. Thank you. Take care, guys.